Uh, <clears throat> let me start off by thanking all the organizers of the Tibet Forum. And I've been contacting Tashi Dumla and Gindu uh, Gatsala. And they've been very kind and helpful. And, you know, I am ready to speak to Tibetan students in, um, in India. I'm a bit of a persona non grata. So my audience is generally uh, activists in the Tibetan world who are, you know, Rangsan activists or maybe students in Western universities. So I, I've never really spoken much in the Tibetan world. So I'm really glad to be able to speak to students here. And especially, I met a number of students yesterday, PhD and MA candidates. And um, it was really, for me, it was wonderful to meet all of you and also to field all your questions and to realize that there is a new generation coming, you know, that will carry on the world that, uh, you know, His Holiness started in exile and which all of us contributed to. but. It's, it's really uh, heartwarming to know that there is a group of people that will still continue this. Because sometimes, you know, when you're working alone, especially like me, I, uh, I work very much alone. I live alone. Uh, in the, not even in a city in the United States. I live up in the mountains, in a forest all by myself, and with my family. We're the only Tibetans in that whole area. So sometimes you forget that there is a new generation of very intelligent, committed, dedicated young people who will follow, you know, who will carry on you know, and continue the Tibetan struggle for freedom, for democracy. So without much ado, I'd just like to first also, uh, thank Dr. Srinachan Zamla for that very generous introduction. Um, and I also want to say just a few words about uh, the Dao Nobula, uh, who you have dedicated this forum to. Uh, I knew him in Darjeeling. He was from that uh, Tibetan, um, this, what they call Central School for Tibetans, because my father was the principal there at that time. And uh, Dao Nobula was a bit of a child prodigy a, a phenomenon because he was not only very brilliant, everyone knew, but he was very hardworking and committed to studies from a very young age. And so my father noticed that and he managed to get him uh, to a Christian school where the standard of education was slightly higher. And from there he moved on to St. Stephen's and you know, eventually to California where he got his PhD and uh, continued his work in the Tibetan society. But I want to say one thing, with, uh, especially with Dao Nobla. You know, the, I think to some extent, the place that he came from, Sakya, has much to do with his intellectual brilliance because one of the greatest sort of Sakya Lamas was uh, Dongun Chagya Pakba, you know, who was the preceptor to the Mongol Khans, huh? Kublai Khan. And he created the universal language for the Mongols. Great linguist. You know, the, that language has pretty much disappeared. But, you know, Tibetans use it, you know, in our seal language, Hori is said, the Tibetans call it Hori. And also that language survives, and this is a couple of scholars have said so, in the Korean Hangul, you know, the Korean alphabet, they say that was adapted from the alphabet that, you know, uh, the Sakya Lama had created. A brilliant person, uh, not just in, uh, you know, in the Dharma, but also in terms of linguistics at that time. And um, there is a great tradition of scholarship from Sakya. I mean, after all, their main principal bodhisattva for all Sakyas is Manjushri, you know, the bodhisattva of wisdom. And that bodhisattva surely blessed the Onobla. And the only unfortunate thing for all of us is that you know, he really didn't live that long. I'm his, we were both born the same year, 1949. And um, unfortunately, ill health um, took him away from us. 
So I just want to, um, from there, move on to the subject I want to deal with tonight. And I just want to say one thing. You know, I'm not an academic. I never studied in a university at all. High school, I don't even have my degree anymore. I don't know where it is. It's been a long time. My interest in a lot of these subjects doesn't come, therefore, from an academic kind of uh, a route right? or a channel. And especially these days now, women's issues are front and center in our attention all over the world, right? in the United States in particular now with the Democratic Party fielding a whole bunch of new women. You know. And things are changing all over the world. For the first time, you know, women's issues on a number of different uh, areas is being seriously addressed. People are at least beginning to discuss it. But my interest in Tibetan women came very indirectly, especially uh, this um, topic that I'm dealing with, how they managed to make their way under the dominance of Tibetan men in the traditional society. It came about primarily through reading uh, travel writers. The late 19th century, early and mid 20th century, uh, British writers who traveled to Tibet, or writers, uh, missionaries traveling from China to Tibet. And all of them, you know, when they are mentioning Tibetan society and, of course, the religion and everything else, they always mention the woman. The position of women in Tibet, it struck them as somewhat unique in this whole Asian kind of uh, world. From China, because women's position in China before the communists came, and even afterwards for a long time, was uh, a difficult one. Women were largely, especially wives, concubines, were kept uh, isolated in the women's quarters, and they were not allowed to meet with other men. Also, for a long time, you know, women in China, they had this foot binding, the tradition where you know, women had, uh, it was not even done surgically, just by f force. All their toes were bent inside because it was believed at that time. It was a fashion statement that women looked much more beautiful with small feet. But of course, it was horrendous for young uh, teenagers and young girls to go through that. And it uh, incapacitated women in China for a very long time. Then, of course, you had even people come from India, because things have changed in India now, but let's say 50, even like before independence, you had women who mainly, even the Muslim community and the Hindu community, women who were isolated. They lived in what they called zananas or bibi girls. And when visitors came to someone's house, women couldn't go and receive them. They were isolated. Also, like, you know, it's very recent that, you know, Muslim women could divorce their husband. I mean, wasn't it this year that uh, this whole thing of triple talaq, that a man can just um, declare that he's divorced his wife three times and it's done, you know? And also Hindu women could only begin to divorce their husband in the 1950s, especially after the you know, Hindu Marriage Act was passed, you know, after independence. While in Tibet, none of this occurred. I am not idealizing Tibet. Right? The, the position of women was not equal. It was unfair in many ways. But on these major things, Tibetan women were quite independent. And this is what struck Western travelers, and even other travelers who moved to uh, India. So just let me give you a few kind of, um, this is from um, an American writer, Saidam Cutting. You know, he talks when he traveled through Lhasa and also through China. The wives of Tibetan nobles possessed of a quality extraordinarily rare in women of the Orient. Freedom was part of their tradition, for their country had never known the Indian system of Purda or the Chinese custom of infanticide, uh, little girls in Tibet being as welcome as boys. Every Tibetan woman has the right to select her own husband, to run her own household, and to own property. 
And it goes on. Uh, there's another writer, Joseph Rock, he wrote on Eastern Tibet. Huh? Meeting ladies of Muli, which is in Eastern Tibet, the hostess, like a Tibetan lady of high rank and of acknowledged equality with men, showed none of the Chinese women's desire to mask her feelings or to retire into the background. So, and this is uh, this last one, this quotation, is from Shen Sungling, who was the last Chinese Guomintang, huh? nationalist Chinese representative in Lhasa. He wrote a book that was later published in, uh, by Stanford University in, uh, in the United States. So he says, Western writers have remarked on the free and respectable status of Tibetan womanhood. It is true that they do not bind their feet, nor do they observe parda, and as a rule, they control the family purse strings. However, Tibetan gentlemen do not bring chairs for the ladies, nor believe in ladies first. Now, the last uh, comment, I think, is a bit unnecessary, because Tibetans didn't use chairs to begin with, but we all sat on cushions. Nonetheless, he even, he, even the Chinese there sort of observed this. But I have to also, you know, I can, there's a number of other observations I have, about eight or nine of them from different books, but we have to also uh, realize one thing, that legally, Tibet, in Tibet, women were not really equal, huh? or in terms of religious institutions. All the big, great monasteries, the Debung, Saraganda, they never had. I mean, women were not even allowed to, to stay in um, any monastic area after dark. They had to leave that whole area. And there were no uh, women abbots. Women, the nunneries in, in Tibet were small, and they were always considered uh, secondary to the main male-dominated uh, sort of monasteries. And also in the political, Politico -relig religious hierarchy, Yorba. All the official, you know, Tibetan officialdom is divided between the aristoc uh, aristocratic officials and the monastic officials. And monastic officials, there were no women, women in there, neither in the aristocracy. No women took part in government. So th that, you know, you have to understand was the reality back in Tibet at that time. But nonetheless, Tibetan women could own, let's say, businesses and you know, her own money, but they could not own property, land. In Tibet, from imperial times, right, from the, when the Tibetan Empire first started, land was considered the possession of the state, of the emperor. And even aristocrats who received land, right, grants, it was, uh, in a sense, it could be resumed by the state if they did not provide enough men from the families to serve as officials or as warriors. Because the whole Tibetan Empire, right from the beginning, was an empire based on war, warfare. Right? And that's with most great countries in the world. You know, the initial stage of civilization coming is war. Right? It's through military exercise that Tibet started this empire. So the problem then was, of course, women, women can't inherit land in such a condition. But there, was, there were ways in which they could do it. Let's say you know, a certain family, you only had girls. There were no men. According to the strict law, that land would be resumed by the state. But Tibetans developed this uh, custom of uh, bringing in what they call makpa, which would seem, you know, the normal term used is uh, bridegroom, but it's not. The term is not makpa. Makpa means ma is war. So a warrior substitute. So you get some young man from somewhere else and he marries, you know, the two sisters or whatever there is. And they dominate, you know, like it is, he has to take their name, that family name. So the man who joins that family gives up his uh, initial kind of surname, becomes part of that family in which these women have taken him in, you know. So that way the family is kept intact. And women also, because of such systems that they created, you know, in, in these 
uh, hostile sort of legal sort of situations. They managed to get a certain amount of control, you know, over uh, property and over uh, the finances of the family, and even over to a certain extent uh, authority in the family, you know, because the women usually two or three sisters, even if there's a husband, they tend to dominate. You know, and I know a couple, I'll talk about them, because I know actual sort of people who still exist here, who, who keep this sort of uh, the way of um, marriage and running a family. Now also, of course, you all know in Tibet we had polyandry, right? It's about 30 or 40 percent of the uh, population. If you had two or three sisters, they would just get a man from somewhere else, and then he joined the family. You, so you had one wife with two brothers. And that uh, custom is not only in Tibet, but wherever the Tibetan Empire was. So it, it also predominates in Ladakh. In Himachal Pradesh in the north, in Kinor, Spiti, they still do it. Because they're, cult they're culturally Tibetan, right? those people there. But they have, um, because their neighbors are Hindus, so they try to explain it. They call this, our marriage is a Pandava marriage. They explain it through Hindu mythology, you know, through the Mahabharata. That's what they do, the people up there. So, but they still uh, continue with that, and it, to a certain extent, it serves an important purpose. Unlike, let's say, land in India or in China, where it's very fertile, so even if you had a small acreage of land, you could produce enough crops to sustain a family. In Tibet, land really has to be worked. A lot of the land is arid. You need a lot of people to work the land. It, if you try to divide your land or subdivide it, you know, like you do in India, it would be disastrous for people. And especially when in Tibet, we, are, we live in very remote areas. You, families have to have a certain amount of size to protect themselves also against bandits and things, you know. So they don't like to divide the family. And so it serves a good purpose. And that fact of one woman having two husbands and she controls, let's say, uh, to a certain extent, the favors, she, you know, the, she controls the sex, right, in the family. And, and that gives her considerable power. You know, I have m met families where this sort of marriage takes place, has taken place. Women tends to be the, you know, in some ways, she tends to dominate the family. So to move on, because I want to talk of actual individual women, right? And I want to talk of women in, in the days to start with of the Tibetan Empire. Because that is where our sort of uh, political, you know, even our linguistic culture, language, everything starts, was with the creation of the Tibetan Empire. And uh, we will forget a lot of the early uh, sort of emperors and dynasties that half exist in mythology, but start with the actual person that we know historically 100%. Fungsan Gampo, right? Around 600, circa 600 uh, BCE. And he united Tibet. Now, in that effort to unite Tibet, and you all know the story, he took one bride from Nepal, right? Princess from Nepal and then princess from China. And, but also, his senior queens were from Tibet. But in unite, trying to unite Tibet, and because Tibet was, uh, a number of different aristocratic entities, also kingdoms. He fought many wars in order to bring them within the empire. But the greatest kingdom, even they see an empire by itself, was uh, a place called Shangshun, which now means all of Western Tibet, from Mount Kailash onwards, all of Ladakh, Himachal, all these areas was, was uh, this entity called Shangshun, their religion was also Bhur, right? We all know that. But in order, you know, and there was a great competition, and Bhur, and you know, Shangshun itself had its own distinct culture, and some scholars claim even its own written language, because the Tibetan Yalung dynasty under Songsen Gampo had yet to send, you know, people to India to pick up the Devanagari script and create the Tibetan script, right? So there was this great competition. 
And one woman made the difference. So let me just show you. This, this is uh, the image of Sungsan Gampo in the middle, and the bride from Nepal, the queen from, uh, from China, which in Guangzhou. But this is from the, there are a number of different uh, images, one in the Jokang, but this is from the Potala image. Yeah? So just to give you a sense of how they dress, and this is also from the Potala. Maybe the Chinese princess, I'm not too sure, but I want to give you an idea of how women appeared and how they dressed. But, because Songzhen Kampo's sister, called Semarkar, probably she dressed in the same way. She probably looked like that. We are not too sure. But, but she made the big, this woman basically, you know, made the major contribution to undermining the Shangshung kingdom and creating the empire. Huh? Because Songzhen Kampo's uh, empire building path was blocked by Shangshung. She was sent as a bride to the king of Shangshung. Initially, they hoped some kind of mutual understanding could bring about unity. But then she was a great um, conspirator. She conspired to get Song Zen Kampu to attack her own husband. And she sent secret messages in, um, in poetry. Not written poetry, because they didn't have the written language then, but in oral poetry through messengers. And we have samples, actually, even of the writing, which later was recorded. And you can find them in the Tun Huang documents, in the old Tibetan chronicles. Because there are two groups of uh, documents that were collected, right? old Tibetan chronicles and old Tibetan annals. And the princess's poems are there, that people remember it later jotted down. And especially because she, she became important because of the fact that she finally managed to even send coded messages huh, in poetry through messengers to her brother where to attack her husband. And of course, you may think it's not a nice thing to do, but when you build empires, right, you have to be ruthless. And those people were. And the, after the king of Shangshun was killed and this army was defeated, then the Tibetan Empire, you know, came into being and basically dominated all of uh, Central Asia for a long time, up to the gates of China. So we won't go into that because that's not the topic of my conversation. But Semarkar, that was a princess. She was uh, you know, the first Tibetan female politician who actually made a huge difference to our history as we know it even now. Then there was another Tibetan empress. This time she was not even the princess. She's called, her name was Timalo. She married Songzhen Gampo's uh, grandson. And I won't go through the names and things because um, it'll get boring and confusing. But Timalo, she married Songzhen Gampo's grandson, but then discovered that that emperor, that very young emperor that she married when she was young also, was controlled by one clan, one group of aristocrats called the Gar clan. And the emperor was basically a puppet. And she didn't, and she was someone also, you know, with her own internal strength. So she conspired. She pushed her husband. She conspired enough. So in the end, they, her husband, and she, together behind him, they overthrew the Gar clan that actually dominated Tibet at the time. And of course, people, you know, they, they were fighting people, right? the warriors. They massacred the Gar huh? and restored the Tibetan emperor to a point that even like, and she was, she lived a very long life, Trim, uh, Trimalo, that even her son, her grandson, she, you know, she managed to live long enough to see them come to the throne. She even kept up correspondence at that time with the Tang Emperor, the Emperor of China, and managed to get another Chinese princess for her grandson. So these were women from that early period, right? We don't even have, 
of course, proper images of them, but it's, a, you know, it's worth remembering that even the Tibetan Empire, women did play a role. Although it was a, a military affair, it was an empire of warriors and fighters, nonetheless, women did play a role. And th these are documented. Huh? This is not something, this is not a local legend. This is actually in these chronicles and annals that were discovered much later, you know, by Western scholars in the sands of Central Asia and in Tunhuang. So let's move on from there. Oh, and also Trimalo, even Chinese scholars who um, studied, you know, Tibetan history have mentioned her because they compare her to this Tang Empress called Wu Zetian. You know, she, she was really a ruthless emperor. Like, she managed to run the Tang dynasty for about two or three decades, very successfully. Very, very able woman. But in the Chinese male-dominated kind of historiography, she is always regarded as something uh, unpleasant and um, you know, very negative. While in the Tibetan documents about Trimalo, there it really is no kind of um, bias one way or the other. So to move on from there, I just want to mention that although I have talked of Tibetan women in, um, in politics here, in early Tibetan imperial kind of nation building, I want to uh, say one thing that Tibetans have all the women didn't play a role in the main sort of political, spiritual institutions of Tibet. There were Tibetan, very important Tibetan uh, female, uh, let's say, religious figures. I'm sure that you've, you all know about um, the Majik Labdun, one of the great Tibetan Siddhis, Maha Siddhis. You know, and her practices spread all over Tibet. And there are a number of others, but I won't go to that. Because this, especially on the spiritual side, it has been documented by uh, Western uh, academics, especially women who have written about this. So you'll find that in a number of books also. So if you want to read about Tibetan spiritual kind of uh, teachers and you know, leaders, uh, you can find it in other books. While the ones I want to talk about, you won't find it in many books. These are stuff that I've had to do my own sort of research on. Right? But um, even on the question of Tibetan women, spiritual uh, sort of masters, these are not something that's quite distant from the Tibetan population. Huh? You know Tibetan opera, Hamu, Ba. Three, three Tibetan operas, the main, the principal persons there are women. You know, Suki Nima, the story, which is taken from uh, Mm, an Indian classic under the, what's the name? Uh, uh, Kali Dasa's great um, poetry. Shakuntala, but that's the old story, which is Tibetanized. And you have uh, Sukhinima, then you have Doa Sangmo, and the true story about a uh, Tibetan woman, spiritual master in Sang called uh, Ajinangsa. So, minimum we have three principles in Tibetan opera, in performances, who are women. So to move on from there, I would want to talk about women who I knew personally, I interviewed, who fought in the 56 uprising inside Tibet, in eastern Tibet, and come. The first major uprising against communist Chinese troops, PLA. This one is. Um, She's passed away. She stayed in a Chinese prison and Laogai camps for 18 years. When she came out, she was very old. But when she was young, her father was a chieftain of a district in Taya, I said, in Kham. He fought with the other chieftains against the communists. Number of wars. When he died, the family didn't have any heirs. So he wanted his daughter to take over. And she did. Initially, you know, some of the men were reluctant to serve under a woman, but then she got some of her men to hold them down. She whipped them, 
that you have to obey my orders. And she really kept up, uh, for a number of years, she managed to keep up her war against uh, the People's Liberation Army to a point where finally, you know, when the CIA was supplying the Tibetans with a great deal of uh, weapon, one of the last major kind of conflicts was in the, the border of Amdo and Kamba, you know. So there, there were about 30 or 40,000 resistance fighters. Chinese communists, there were about five divisions came. Not only just uh, foot soldiers, but tanks, uh, jet planes. The CIA threw in a number of different Tibetan instructors, trainers, special anti-tank groups, but they were all wiped out. But then, they, because the CIA actually provided the number of weapons, she managed to get some. She told me she actually got a whole bunch for her own men you know, when they were fighting. But when they finally wiped out, she tried to escape. She had her own family with her. All her men were killed. She finally ended up escaping through a mountain pass, carrying her old mother with her, you know? And then she was arrested and put in, uh, taken to Lhasa because she was quite important to us. She was not just um, some resistance fighter, she was the chief. So the Chinese put her for 18 years and finally she came out to Dharamsala where I interviewed her. You know, and uh, she, she was a very strong woman, you know. She, and I managed to do a full interview with her, but at that time I was writing a lot of other things. I couldn't publish it. But we managed to get one American writer who was really interested in this sort of thing to interview her also, and we helped with the interviews. And we published her biography, I think, um, from California. So it's called, uh, I forget now. I apologize if my memory is not working that well. You know, it was a very long flight, and my whole body clock is gone. I didn't sleep last night. You know, your sleep cycle gets totally kind of disrupted, right? So normally I'm, I'm pretty good with names and things, but today I'm just feeling a little woozy. So you must forgive me, and especially if I say something stupid also, you know, I'm just going to say it from right now. You know, you can blame it on the long flight that I had to take. Now, to move on from there, there's another woman that I, who's photographed this one. I'm trying to get a better photograph from the fan because she still exists, she's still living. The, uh, the previous woman died a few years ago. This one is from the Gary Sang family. Uh, they lived in Delhi for some time, here in Meroli. But I think she is now in Dehradun. She was the younger, the two sisters married the chieftain of Nyarong. She's the younger sister. When her husband was taken as a hostage by the Chinese in 56, they took a number of male leaders and important lamas, to, invited them to a meeting in a place called Tatsudo, which is on the eastern uh, frontier town, and kept them as a hostage. She then called all the men in her district, and she sort of rose up against the Chinese. All over Eastern Tibet, that was starting. So she got involved. She, was, she wore a man's chuba, you know what we call a chopchen, not the women's one. She had a, one Mauser pistol here and her own rifle. And she called all the young men. She kept 10 young men as her bodyguard. She called them taktru, the tiger cubs. She even had Chinese sort of paid uh, you know, collaborators trying to assassinate her. But, she, you know, she, when you look at her, when she's barely five foot one or two. And she has very soft spoken, la la la. You can't imagine this woman going around killing people, right? <laughs> but then she took them to the Chinese headquarters in Yarong, the Zongdi. And there she made them attack the Zong. And she said, anyone who turns back, I'm going to shoot him myself. I met some of her surviving fighters, and they all, you know, they love her. They said, you know, she's just tough. You can't believe this woman now. And she's old and she's a nun now, you know. But um, finally, they kept losing. 
more and more Chinese soldiers were sent from eastern Tibet, and they retreated all the way. Finally, they reached Lhasa, and then they uh, came to escape when the Dalai Lama left. And so I think the family, the, her older sister died last year. And Yari Rinpoche, you know, right, Yari, uh, the Tibetan, Dalai Lama's representative to Beijing for negotiation. It's his younger mother, you know. So she's still around. Um, I interviewed and talked with her many, on many occasions. She doesn't like to talk about it now. She pretends that, no, she wouldn't kill anyone. She's just a that religious person. But all her kind of followers told me that she was very fierce, that you never crossed her, you know. She was capable of, you know, unimaginable violence towards them if they didn't obey her. So, but in the Gerritsang family, this is with the communist Shwa. But resistance to the Chinese was not only with the communists, earlier with the Gomintang, the nationalist Chinese government Shwa. There, you know, from the Jerry family, their grandmother was a woman called Jerry Chimi Doma. I am not, I don't think this is actually her photograph, but it's, you know, those women are so impressive, I'm going to assume that it is. Right? <laughs> Chimi Doma was very famous because Mao Zedong himself mentions her. She fought the Gomintang, the nationalist government, you know, uh, in Sichuan province. Right? They had the warlord and the Chinese governor at that time there, uh, Liu Wenhui. This is the guy. He's the Gomintang governor of Sichuan province, which is a huge province. And he had a running war with this woman. Finally, he captured, they managed to invade Nyarong itself. They burned down her house, what they call Giripotang. Like it was a big castle. And she came out of the castle and is burning. Her men were killed with a sword in one hand, with a pistol in the other. And she kept on fighting till they shot her in the leg. And they captured her, tied her in chains, and took her all the way to, you know, down to Chengdu, the capital of Sichuan province. And they executed her, firing squad. Huh? And before she, you know, this I interviewed on Yarongwa for a book I did earlier, it's called Warriors of Tibet. And he told me this story and he said, before she died, she said, people of Nyarong, I die for you, do not forget me. But when I interviewed this man, I was fairly young, you know, and I, this is only in storybooks that people say things like this. Right? So I told him, I don't believe you, this is, this is too kind of glib, it's like a story. And he got really mad with me. She said, just write down everything as I say. Right, it is. She said that. And later there was confirmation came uh, about her activities from this Baba Pinso Wangkel, who was a Chinese collaborator for the, with the communists. Right? Earlier he had, um, he had his own problems with the Gomintang, with the nationalist government. So he had written uh, a number of songs, one in praise of Gary Chimidoma. You know. Mao mentions her in, uh, in his biography that was written by the American uh, leftist writer, Edgar Snow. It's called Red Star Over China. Have you seen that book? It's in Penguin, even in paperback. So there Mao, because when they had the long march, when the communists were being were fighting with the Gomintang and they were losing at one point, they took this long march all the way from the Shanxi, where the headquarters were, up to the uh, highlands of Yan'an, where they started their second base there. And on the way, they crossed into Tibet, a number of Tibetan areas. <clears throat> and Mao Tatung said, there was this Tibetan queen. That's what he calls her. He said, we have a debt to pay her. Because she and her men, they rolled huge rocks down on them. She killed a lot of uh, even communist troops at that time. So Mao said this jokingly to Edgar Snow when he interviewed him. So actually, it is there. Her, you know, this woman who resisted the Chinese 
made enough of an impression on the communist leaders that he remembered her when he discussed this with uh, his biographer, this American biographer. So, but I want to talk about other revolutionaries in the Tibetan world. So, I'm, you know, if it sounds a little too violent, I'll get to the peaceful parts a little later. Well, but I do want to go through the question of women actually taking revolutionary uh, fighting roles because which is, it is un, unusual. In India, of course, we had with, uh, you know, with uh, the mutiny, as the British called it, the Indian uprising against the British. There's the Rani of Jhansi story. Right? But it's one. In the, the Tibetan world, there are a number of this. After the communists had really climbed down, after March 10th, when the Dalai Lama had left Tibet, the fighting had all stopped, when the CIA had stopped helping the Tibetans, you know, and there was really no more Tibetan resistance army. During the Cultural Revolution, when there was certain upheaval within Tibet, in a place called Nyemo, one woman, she used the internal fighting between the uh, communist groups but to her advantage. She led one entire group, and she, she converted that from a very communist kind of uh, red guard group to uh, you know, have you, you know the story of Kesar, the Tibetan epic hero. Right? She claimed to these people that she was like Kesar's. There was a goddess that bas basically helped Kesar in his fight, you know, against demons and so on and so forth. If you know the story, she claimed that she was this goddess. That when she went into a trance, that goddess came to her, and she called all these men who were with her by the names of Kesar and Kesar's heroes. And she used this to, first of all, in the district, she cleaned it off all the other Chinese uh, district administrators. But then she even attacked the PLA garrison, few of them. She got rifles. And then she spread out like all the way to Mount Kailash from Nemo, from central Tibet. Her men went around. They caused chaos in Tibet at that time. Huh? She was leading them. It got so much that Tibetans started, you know, inventing stories about her, even in Lhasa city. That was under the communists. This was during the Cultural Revolution when people were really scared of the, the leadership in China. But then they said her name was, uh, they called her Nyemo Ani. Her actual name was Tinle Chudun. She was a nun before. So the nun from Nemo, that's what they called her, Nemo Ani. So th there's all these stories going around in Lhasa even. Oh, Nemo Ani and her men are going to come to Lhasa. And when she gets to the river, she's going to strike the river with her, with her hands, and the river will part. <laughs> and then her men will come across. People believe that sort of thing, to a point where the finally Chinese had to send a few regiments of troops. And they, you know, basically they killed a lot of the people there in Yemo. There was a lot of fighting. They arrested her and about 10 other people, and they executed her. So this is a photograph of her being executed, just, just minutes before her execution. They've hung this plaque there, Tinde Tindechudus. It's not a very good photograph, but that's all we really have. I, you know, it, they had an exhibition in Nemo itself. They kept photographs there to warn the local people not to do this sort of thing again. Uh, one Italian photographer told me he had seen something like this. So me and my friends, we paid for him to go back to Tibet again, you know, and to bribe the person, local uh, old man who was looking after this exhibition. So to get someone to go outside and smoke a cigarette with him and drink tea, and he went inside and took photographs of these. Uh, so this is her, just moments before her. They brought her all the way to Lhasa. Her execution was a big thing in Lhasa. Everyone remembers it there. And this is her sidekick, Renjun, Rinzi Doga, who was also executed. Ten other people were executed on one day. So now, you know, enough of violence. Right? 
with Tibetans are supposed to be nonviolent people. But the thing is, it is revolutionary what these women did. The way they used the existing political chaos, in some ways, they used all this Gesar epic stories in order to foment basically, you know, against people who they thought were tormenting them, the local administrators who were taxing them terribly at that time in Yemen. People were dying of hunger. That was the time of also of the great famines inside Tibet, right? And in Tibet and China. So there was this huge resentment of uh, communist authority at that time in Tibet. And these people did actually revolt. I don't know of even men actually managing to accomplish so much inside Tibet at that time, 56. I've heard of a few, but nowhere so, as effective as she was. She managed to use the proper language to get into people's, you know, like into their minds and to in, instigate them to revolt against the People's Liberation Army, which is no easy thing, Raba. They were all wiped out. So, but uh, to move on, there were women in Tibet in March who demonstrated peacefully against the communists and, of course, who paid for their. But you've heard of this, uh, the Pamu um, Kuisang, what the Tibetans, you know, she came from a noble, uh, she was from a smaller family, but her uncle became uh, the Tsarong, who was a minister. And so this is her serving as a bridesmaid uh, in the middle there. She was one of the main principal leaders of the uh, March 10th uprising in Lhasa, one of the women <laughs> leaders. This is another photograph. None of these photographs are very good. She's on the side there. And with her was another, uh, there's an older nun. Who, there were two leaders. Right. And um, so this is Galinsha Chela, you know. So these two women actually led the women's demonstration that all of you know and have heard about in Lhasa at that time when there was the March 59 uprising. But at the, you know, at the same time, there were some women, there was one aristocratic woman who was the Chinese even accused, Halul Hajam. Who actually, she had managed somehow to get a brand gun on the roof of her house, and when the PLA soldiers came, she, she started shooting them. And she and her husband were arrested. I think they were executed also later. She was quite famous in Lhasa because she was a great Lhasa beauty in the 40s. And she was the first Tibetan women biker. One person told me she had a black BSA that she roared through Lhasa at that time. <laughs> was biking, you know, after, the, uh, after 50 when the Chinese came in, you know, a lot of conventions changed. People started to use motorcycles and things in Lhasa. So she was the first Tibetan woman biker also and then she fought. So that all these things happened inside Tibet and of course Later, even when he came out in exile, Tibetan women joined, you know, the SFF, you know, the, in Chakrata, right? where the Indian government were training Tibetan paratroopers. So we had Tibetan women paratroopers. This is the first kind of combat paratroopers that you actually had in the Indian army. Huh? So it made quite an impression at that time that even Mrs. Indira Gandhi came up to Chakrata. And she, po you know, they gave her a demonstration, jumping from plane with full battle gear in battle conditions. She was very pleased. She took them. Uh, she asked them all down to Delhi, to her house, for tea. And then later, during the uh, Republic Day parade, they got special VIP seats. You know, I think about 30 or 40 of these girls. So there's at least one picture of these girls that I have. And even, you know, like even older women, just not, let's not just look at the younger women. Right? I remember in Kalampong in 62, you know, during the Chinese invasion, when a lot of people were running away from these hill areas because the Chinese uh, army was coming into India. Right? 
Tibetan women in Kalimpong volunteered for the Home Guard. They were going to fight. They said, just let us have rifles. Just give us basic training. We'll stay and fight. This is a picture of them. All your Amalas. You know, these are local Tibetan women. So the thing, what I want to get across to you is they have a kind of attitude. Whether they're capable of something, you know, whether they can succeed or not, they're strong women, you know. Yes, we'll do it. That's what they said. And, you know, even in uh, what impressed me also, like the first women's con international women's conference, women's rights, that was held in Asia, in Beijing, if you remember, uh, way back in 1990, Kature. And the Tibetan women who went there, they, you know, like, they were not allowed to speak. There was a whole lot of things, but they came out and demonstrated. So this is a picture just, I know a lot of you uh, know this, but just to remember them, Raba. I won't go into details about this, but uh, so. So now I, I'd just like to get away from all these very aggressive, violent Tibetan women to Tibetan women as diplomats and the roles they played. One very important woman was the Maharani of Sikkim, Yishi um, Dorma. She's from the Tibetan family, leading family from Lhasa. She was sent as a bride to one Chige, you know, the Maharaja of Sikkim, when the British were actually, in some ways, undermining his power. The, the British had problems with Tibet at the time, before the Young Husband Expedition. You know, like the Tibetans totally disagreed with the way that the British were drawing the, uh, the frontiers between Sikkim and Tibet. They were knocking down the boundary markers. And because she came from a Tibetan aristocratic family, her loyalties were to Tibet and to the Maharaja. So she, she kept up a long defiance of British authority, especially the representative in Sikkim was uh, uh, Claude White, who was basically undermining the power of the Chogyal and the power of, you know, and the Tibetans regarded Sikkim as a Tibetan protectorate. You know, he was a Tibetan prince. And they felt the British had no right there. But in the end, of course, the British succeeded. But um, he writes about her. He had to deal with her. Right? At the time, the king, the Chogyal, refused to even talk to the British representative there. They were kept, you know, they were humiliated, they were put down by the British, but she had managed to deal with them and she was very skilled. Her Tibetan, you know, she was very, quite highly educated by Tibetan standards at that time. So he mentions, Lord White says, this woman had a great sense of her own importance. When she talked even to the British, she was, she was never cowed. He said, um, she was very well educated that when they had to send even a, finally, uh, you know, Queen Victoria had a ju uh, diamond jubilee or something, and they wanted Sikkim to send some kind of uh, commemorative letter to the, to the palace. She wrote it all down. He said her handwriting was also beautiful. And he said this woman, and he had a lot of problems with her, but he doesn't mention all of that in his book. But he says, if this woman had been born in Europe, you know, in a high family, let's say in Austria or in the European family, she would be there in the highest kind of, you know, intriguing in European politics. He said that's for sure. She had that capacity. And one of her uh, sort of legacies that still lives with us is that, you know, the British wrote the Gazette of Sikkim. They established, you know, in some ways, their kind of hold over Sikkim by writing a sort of history and the ethnological kind of um, report on Sikkim. So she wanted to come up with some kind of um, a Tibetan, 
a Sikkimese response to the British. So she wrote, and of course the book still exists, I got a copy of it, but uh, the author is, they write, uh, the Maharaja and the Maharani of Sikkim. But actually they said she's the one who wrote it. The Maharaja himself was quite an indolent person. You know, he never did very much. So she wrote this uh, history of, of Sikkim, which even now a lot of scholars find quite fascinating because you know, it was a challenge to British authority yeah? and British movement to Sikkim. And she was someone who did that for many, many years. Yeah. But finally, of course, British power could not be resisted by Ishi Tolma, right? As, uh, you know, as sweet as she looks there, and there's a limit to what you can do against the British Empire you know, at that time. So, but uh, she is a historian. She's not only a diplomat, but a historian. One of the first Tibetan women historians. So the book has been translated even into English. So you, I've got a photocopy, but uh, you know, put together in Sikkim, but I hear some other Western sort of scholars are trying to put together a better um, translation also. The earlier one is not that good. But then I'll give you a more up-to-date sort of Tibetan historian, woman. She's the head of the uh, Department of uh, Tibetan Studies in Sichuan University. She, her PhD came from Harvard, and she earlier taught in uh, Stanford and some universities in the United States, although she had been educated mostly in Tibet. So her Chinese was very good, her Tibetan was very good, but she picked up her English in the United States and then she went back. So she is a really fine, fine scholar on Eastern Tibetan history. So it, the book she's written is on Nyarong Gobo Namgyal, you know, the, the great chieftain of Nyarong, who actually dominated the whole of uh, Eastern Tibet for a long while. And his sort of conflict with the Qing dynasty, we you know, with the Manchus. It's a really good book. Her English is also, you know, she's a good writer, so you can, it's not too difficult to go through also. So try to, if you can, um, her name is Yundu Somo. She is related, in, uh, some tell me, uh, to the Chagla kings of Tachado, you know. So, now I want to move a little east towards eastern Tibet, because this is where she was teaching. And uh, I'm very grateful to her. I met her a couple of times. You know, all the information I wanted, because I was doing stuff on the uprisings in eastern Tibet. And there are a lot of Chinese documents that I not only don't have, but I don't know how to access, even if I could do it. But she had it all. She has local histories, even Communist Party documentation, everything she, you know, she has an ability to get into. So she, right now she's uh, working in Sichuan province. So she came out with this wonderful book. And, but um, she is not the first Tibetan woman, and she wrote this book in English, huh? but she is not the first Tibetan woman to write a book in English. Actually, the first Tibetan to write a book in English and have it published in London is this lady, Rinchen Lamo. 1925, she published a book called We Tibetans. See, you've seen that. Well, there's people that copies you can get. I think Motilal Banarasi does, brings out copies of those also. So she married um, a British consular officer in Tatsudo, which is the frontier town. And uh, they moved to Britain, but uh, she didn't last very long. I think it was very unhealthy for her. She got tuberculosis in England. Victoria in England was not a very pleasant place to live in, huh? especially I think there's a lot of pollution because of the smog and you know famous London smog. But she wrote this very interesting book called We Tibetans. And the thing what I find fascinating about it is she had never been to Lhasa. She only knew Eastern Tibet. Right? But when she writes that book, you know, 
she assumes she's as good as any other Tibetan woman, that she has the right to talk about Tibetan culture. And you see that book, it's wonderful. She talks about many different subjects, even on uh, political subjects and also on, uh, on the Dharma and you know, on monasteries. So it's, it's uh, she is the first. Before her, I don't think there was any Tibetan, like Dawnobula sort of, in exile, he's one of the first to write a book about a biography of his own and get it published in London. But she is the first. Now, the place where she was, where she married her husband, you know, Mr. King, is this place called Tatsado in eastern Tibet. <laughs> This is the main frontier town between China and Tibet. So that's why you have even a church there, if you noticed, on the left. And then the Buddhist monastery in the front, temple. Mixed Tibetan-Chinese population. This was part of the Tibetan Empire long ago, but then gradually after Gomintang came, they made it a capital of their kind of uh, foothold in eastern Tibet. But the, one of the most important things there was the trade in tea. Tea was imported from China. And um, one of the principal sort of business people, there were these uh, main business establishments. The, Tibetan, the Chinese who imported the tea, the Tibetans who took it from them and then took it to Tibet proper and Tulhasa. And the, um, the estab there were 16 Tibetan establishments, very important firms, huh? business firms. They were, the Sichuan dialect, they were called uh, Khotang. And uh, the Tibetan is called Aja Kaba. Aja meaning older sister, but Kaba meaning negotiator. The person who speaks, Song Dignature. Right? So these women. So the tea came like this from Chinese. You know, the coolies carried them all the way. They were repacked and then sent off to Tibet. On, on the back of yaks, if you see, there's all these small, many. Women ran about at least half of these business concerns. And these were very big. In huge houses with big courtyards, a lot of money changed hands. They were also like hotels, like hostels, um, storehouses, also banks. They served as banks, informal banks. Money was lent. You know, you could uh, get loans from them. There's a whole lot of so these establishments. Um, Uh, um, <clears throat> so one of here, this is Chunyi. This is a photograph of this Chunyi Par Ajakaba. Chunyi Par means between two rivers. That woman ran this whole thing. The men, her husbands, actually probably went out you know, with the caravans to, you know, to far distant places to do trade. But she was the one who, who controlled the purse strings at home. There was another one. This was a painting done by a Chinese visitor at that time, an artist from Shanghai, who took a photograph of this Chinese, of this Tibetan businesswoman. So these women dominated the business there. But it's not only in, uh, you know, in that area that this happened. In Chamdo also, quite a few of the businesses were controlled by women. In Lhasa. So th the thing is, what gave Tibetan women one advantage in, uh, let's say, in their dealings with men was the fact that they were allowed to control money. And they ran a lot of these businesses. So like even when, um, in Tibet, like when the first, you know, our dealings with the British began, on a tentative level, even from the end of the, let's say, the 19th century, when Tibetan's first business people and traders went to, let's say, down to uh, Calcutta and they started buying things. 
They bought also Tibetan women wanted makeup, rouge, powder, and you know you know how men are, man. So when women put on powder and rouge, uh, this the monks you know, you know in Tibet there's dapto, you know, there's this sort of rather fierce monks. They and then women they sort of they act very condescendingly to women, pretty because women put on like perfume and things, man. So there's one verse which shows you actually women's attitude, but also in a, in a way uh, that they're saying them, their money is their own. So uh, I'll read the thing in Tibetan, you know, but, uh, and also I'll try a little translation. So when someone said to some women, no, why are you putting these things on? She said, she replied, Kabo ngare chugir, you know. I put on the white, the powder myself. I put on the red lipsticks and you know rouge. I've done that myself. Please don't get annoyed, any one of you men, basically. I've used my own wallet, you know. So expressing their financial independence. So this was, in some ways, why do you get women there in spite of disadvantages in law and in, in religious institutions, you know, have managed to, you know, take leadership roles when times demanded it to assert themselves is also because of that financial independence with in divorces in Tibet. Well, Tibetan marriages are not religious like Christian marriages or like this, even Hindu marriages, right? Tibetan marriages are all, it's social and it's uh, economic. When you get married in old days in Tibet, first thing you did was, and this is a very modern thing that we did, we had to sign a prenup, you know, marriage agreement, where you, right from the beginning you have to say, if there's a divorce, uh, this much of the property goes back, <laughs> that goes there, you know, both sides of the family, the girl's family and the boy's family, they, they make all these arrangements should, so that there's no problem later on. And then you take that to the district magistrate and you leave a copy there. You know, you know when this, uh, I've got actually a copy of the uh, Tibetan marriage contract. When the, uh, the Queen of Sikkim, she was married in Lhasa. She was a Lhasa girl. Right? So when they did that, they had a document that uh, the great Bengali uh, Tibetologist Sarachandra Das, he reproduced uh, in his book also. It's very interesting. So there's a very, mo these days of course, prenups in the West was something that came about in, uh, let's say 20, 30 years ago. Right? It's a very new thing, even in the West. But in Tibet they were doing it right from the old days. So this gave Tibetan women a tremendous advantage in their dealings with, uh, men. And another thing is, um, in Tibet was um, a kind of a social acceptance that women have equal, you know, in, uh, can drink, can behave in a way pretty much like the men do. It is not all over Tibet, not in Amdo in Eastern Tibet, but in Central Tibet and Lhasa. Women drink freely, you know. Sometimes even get drunk. Nobody considers it to be a scandal. Huh? When in Nobilinka, when the Dalai Lama, there's the great performances, opera performances, you know, right? and all the people go. After the performances, and people have spent the whole day in outside picnicking, you know, Lingatang, and then they get they drink and they come home and all the women are slightly tipsy, they're holding each other, dressed in their best, and they're singing. Right? And people actually from Lhasa go out to see and make fun of these people. Right? They do that even in Dharamsala and Darjeeling, where I lived you know, before. The Tibetan women who went to do, you know, put up prayer flags and stuff, they'd come home in the evening all nicely sort of tipsy, you know, and singing opera songs. So there is an acceptance, which is, you know, in some ways, like even uh, in a place like Darjeeling, which is fairly sophisticated, where you had a, 
you know, multicultural, multi-ethnic sort of population. English expatriates, number of different Indian communities, but uh, Nepali, Tibetan, Bhutanese, people from the Northeast. But Tibetan women were always it's, this exception was like, and even it's accepted in Darjeeling. No one else does it. Even the English ladies are well behaved. Ba. You know, you go to the dance, you have your cocktail, but you don't go out in the streets, you know, singing songs. Ba. But Tibetan ladies, you know, they, they were ladies. They were not just loose women or anything. But that was part of the, you know, the way the society operated. So everyone just laughed a little when they saw this lady, and then she got a little embarrassed when if there was someone that she knew from another community. But this was something that was done quite freely there. I remember in Darjeeling, it's all the, every year. So I mean, of course, it embarrassed the younger people, you know, their children. And all. Says, Amala, please don't do that. And the, the Amala is sort of, you know, singing songs and coming down. But this is something that was noticed quite a lot. And I'd like to conclude by just um, quoting Basil Gould, the British representative who came to Tibet in 1936. And he. Uh, Now here, okay. he talked about this lady, Halul Hajam. She's quite a great lady. That family, two Dalai Lamas, huh? very important. But um, this is what he says. Let me see where I can find if I can find that quote. So I'd just like you. This is Gould. She's here. She had invited some of the people from the British mission. OK, here. Yeah. Lady Hulajam is having a little picnic. And she's invited the British doctor. And this is uh, Pembert Singh. You know Tsing Shakya? I think this is uh, one of his uh, great uncles. You know. Who was, a, who was also who worked at the British mission in, in Lhasa. And that is the Tibet, uh, the British t a telegraph operator who late, later worked for the Tibetan government, who didn't want to go back to London. So he's dressed in Tibetan. No? And this is her son, Halukomo, but she was the great uh, lady. So Basil Gould mentions her in this 1936. Said, she was a member of high society, connected by birth with the two previous Dalai Lamas and who lived on her estate a mile off. In 1904, it had been the headquarters of the Young Husband Expedition to Lhasa. One of the events of the Lhasa season, this is the social season, huh, was an annual luncheon party which she gave to the cabinet, to all the ministers and high, other high officials. Her hospitality was so urgent that often the fate of at least a few of her guests was, where I dine, I sleep. You know, Tibetans, they force you to drink, Raba. Have you noticed this? So all the, they even poke pins at you, you know, if you don't drink fast enough. So a lot of her guests sometimes would be, and she had the best, best food, best drinks. She had a fund of jokes and stories which were reputed to be very broad. So she, no, she, she was that sort of woman. And he, he ends, I doubt whether even in England, men and women live on such natural and easy terms as Tibet. You know, she's not a beauty. I think she's way past her age. But she, she wasn't young. But she had a lot of boyfriends. <laughs> you know, and of course, some because she was politically powerful, right? maybe for that, but others actually who liked her because she was funny, she was very witty, she was well educated, you know, she had the best jokes in Lhasa. And then also, she, um, I have a collection, I think Tashi Singla lent it to me, 
of even verses written by one of her admirers. One young official had written about her, Tiara, you know. So it's, it's that sort of society which, in a sense, where women, you know, like, never idealize it. Right? I mean, we are not saying that, you know, women need political power and stuff, which, you know, we didn't have at that time. But in their own way, through their own charm, their own ability, their own uh, business skills, and through their uh, courage, you know, they managed to maintain, you know, a near equal, you know, if not a superior position in Tibetan society. So thank you very much. And before I just finish also, I just want to say, I'm glad there's so many Tibetan women here. I've hoped, I've encouraged you to uh, not to accept, especially in exile, the, the problem that, you know, in exile community, uh, a lot of the older Tibetan traditions in some ways uh, changed because you know of living in, in India where you're supposed to, women are supposed to be a little more sort of uh, reserved well, to stay at home. So we've, you know, you've had, we've had cases actually came out in Tibetan papers of, you know, even like heads of, uh, of Tibetan settlements trying to shame young women who had boyfriends outside that community, you know. So even in Delhi, I think, and other places. So that sort of thing is totally unacceptable in, in old Tibet. Huh? This is done here, you know, in India, because where there's the idea that each community must protect its own woman and not allow her to, you know, go out of that. Which sort of thing wasn't acceptable in Tibet. People intermarried. We had a small Muslim minority. Tibetan women married into that. And it was perfectly legal to do so. Nobody could raise objections. So I want to, whatever it is, you know, this whole thing is not well put together. I just did it quickly. But I changed, actually, I changed a number of topics with uh, Teshi Yang Zumla. I was saying, how about this? You know, shall I talk about this? Just talk about environment and uh, wildlife preservation. But uh, she liked the woman presentation that I did. So it's a bit ragged. So I want to apologize for that. Uh, I'll put it together better, you know, like for, are you publishing something afterwards? So I'll get it done before that and get all the photographs organized. I really don't like talking and doing the PowerPoint at the same time. It, it never works out. You know, it's like the file, you know, like pictures get lost. So I want to apologize for this. And I hope this at least provided you some kind of glimpse into our past, where we lived in a society which, you know, for all its fault, on women's issues at least, there's something we can be a little proud about. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.